Welcome uh, to the uh, town hall meeting. Thank you for being here uh, on a very, very important um, uh, uh, question. And I just want to say, bienvenidos a todos. <laughs> that was Spanish. <laughs> the last time we were here, um, we, were we were talking about the question of should we or should we not go to Iraq? And it was a well attended, uh, a thoughtful presentation with many people who had participated in that discussion, after which uh, we were able to make uh, an informed decision. Today, uh, with uh, the issue of healthcare and healthcare reform, uh, it's, it's a very, very um, long term question that we've been dealing with since. Um, um, over 60 years, and I believe that um, the very first bill that was introduced was in 1943 by the father of John Dingle, Jr. So in every session has been introduced. But I want to uh, first start off by um, welcoming you and um, thanking you for taking the time uh, today to be part of this uh, town hall meeting. And I would like to uh, begin by introducing someone that many of you already know, uh, today's uh, moderator, uh, Mr. Kirk Hansen. Uh, Mr. Hansen is the executive director of the Marcula uh, Center for Applied Ethics here at Santa Clara University. And he's a professor of organization and society quite apt um, in terms of the, the title. He's a former faculty director of the Sloan program at Stanford University Business School, where he taught for 23 years and is now uh, an emeritus um, faculty member. Mr. Hansen serves on the board of directors at the Skull um, Foundation is on the advisory board of the Entrepreneurs Foundation of Silicon Valley. And I just want to thank publicly Mr. Hansen for being here and participating in this uh, uh, town hall meeting. Please welcome Mr. Hansen. Thank you, Congressman Honda, for that uh, introduction. Uh, and thank you all for coming to this forum to help us better understand House Rules 3200 and to hear the community's concerns and feedback on health care reform. I'm pleased to welcome all of you on behalf of uh, Santa Clara University. Santa Clara is pleased to host visits of, of elected officials with their constituents. Uh, and this uh, kind of session is the best of re uh, representative democracy. Uh, the Markula Center for Applied Ethics, which I head uh, here at the university, uh, is dedicated to discussion of public policy questions from a values and an ethics perspective. And we're particularly glad to uh, be involved in, in this particular dialogue today. Um, Healthcare reform is one of the greatest challenges facing our country now. It's a problem that affects all of our lives, and it's truly inspiring to see so many of you turn out. This is one of two sessions Congressman Honda will be doing this afternoon. The second is at 3 p.m. in Los Gatos. Um, I would like to encourage everyone uh, to uh, participate in, in today's session. Before we begin, there are uh, a few ground rules that we're going to be following today, which will ensure that uh, we all are able to have our say. First, on behalf of the university, I request that you don't uh, eat or drink anything inside uh, the theater. Uh, we also request that you leave any signs and banners outside. Uh, these are uh, uh, policies for today. Bathrooms are located in the lobby, as you may have seen, uh, to the right for men and to the left uh, for women. Um, and if you'd uh, do your best to help us keep the auditorium clean, it'll be ready for, uh, for classes tomorrow. Um, several staff members are moving through the audience uh, with question cards and registration forms. Please fill out the registration forms so Congressman Honda's office can provide you with information about future events like this. If you're interested in asking Congressman Honda a question today, please fill out a question card. Make sure that you include your name, your address, and the question on the card, and pass it to one of the staff members who is circulating in the auditorium. This forum is on health care, and so the questions that we'll be entertaining today will be those uh, that deal with health care and not with other subjects. Uh, 
also, if questions are repetitive, I may exercise the moderator's uh, uh, prerogative to say we've dealt with that question a couple of times already and we'll pass to the next question. Uh, cards will be drawn, lottery style, uh, and if your card is drawn, you'll be invited to come to the front and ask your question at the microphones. Now, where are the microphones? You've got them. Okay, so staff members will be bringing the microphones to you and you can meet them uh, part way. Um, we ask that you keep your question or comment short and constructive, probably not more than a minute for your question, uh, so that we can accommodate as many people as possible in the, in the short one hour that we'll have here uh, this afternoon. Uh, if your address is not included on the card, or if it's not located in the 15th Congressional District, Congressman Honda will unfortunately not be able to answer that question today so that he can answer as many from his constituents as possible. Uh, if you are one of the constituents and your card does not get pulled, you will receive a response letter from the congressman's office uh, within the next three to four weeks. Thank you very much for your cooperation uh, on all of that. Now, uh, without further ado, uh, I'd like to introduce Congressman Honda, invite him to make an opening statement, and then we'll go forward with the questions. Congressman Honda was elected in 2001 to represent California's 15th Congressional District in the House of Representatives. In Congress, he serves on the Appropriations Committee, where he's a member of the subcommittees on Labor, Health, and Human Services and Education, Commerce, Justice, and Science, and the Subcommittee on the Legislative Branch. He's also the chair of the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus uh, and as a Democrat uh, Senate whip. Uh, Congressman Honda, thank you for holding this session and I'll be turning it over to you. Thank you, Kirk. And, um I'm pleased to see um, so many folks here today and taking their time out to participate in this discussion. Um, see, our country is really at a breaking point economically. Our companies are saddled with rising business costs that hamper their competitiveness. Our families are struggling under rising mountains of debt, increasingly unable to afford insurance and fearful of the consequences of going without. The time for that fear to end is, is really now. Uh, it's been too long that we've been working with this and people say you shouldn't rush into it. Well, folks, we're not rushing into it. It's been too long. And I'm confident that in the ability of Congress and the President to move forward together and find a uniquely uh, American solution to one of the most pressing issues of our time. I'm committed to health reform that will improve care, drive down costs, and increase competition and accountability. Right now, more than 47 million Americans do not have health insurance, and that's from the last census. More than 85 percent of whom are, in, are working families. In the 15th district alone, there are 77,000 people who do not have health insurance. The 15th district, we have the highest per capita of degrees, advanced degrees, and probably the highest uh, median income. And we have 77,000 people who do not have health insurance. People who in 2008 um, cost local health care providers over $205 million of uncompensated care. And insurance has become harder and harder to get. So since 1987, the average family health insurance policy has risen from 7% of the median family income to 17%. In the last year, 53% of American households have cut back on health and their health care due to cost concerns. 19% of all U.S. businesses are planning to stop providing employee health care benefits in the next three to five years. And we know that when we listen to the news that a lot of the, a lot of the companies are saying that they can't afford an increase in salary and, in, and maintaining their health uh, programs. And it's a, big, it's a big problem. So the loss of health insurance can have catastrophic results. For example, in 2007, 60% of U.S. bankruptcy were due to medical costs. A couple of years back, 
me, the retired seniors, who said, I have a comfortable retirement, and now I'm faced with medical problems and I'm facing bankruptcy. Each year, uninsured patients cost the American taxpayer over $56 billion in uncompensated care, mostly from emergency room visits. And each year, the broken health care system costs us as much as $248 billion in lost productivity. Underinsurance and unpleasant surprises tucked into the fine print of complex private insurance plans means that here in California, more than $2.2 million have some medical debt. Two thirds of those people incurred that debt while they were insured. Congress is considering reasonable solutions to bring stability and clarity to the healthcare system while preserving and even expanding competition. But we must act now and to solve this problem. We have waited decades for private insurance companies to self-correct, and now we must act decisively to build a new healthcare system, preserving the best elements of our system while ensuring affordable, accessible, guaranteed coverage for all. HR 3200 contains a structure to allow America to do just that. Under the bill, insurance companies will no longer be able to impose yearly or lifetime caps on treatment. They will not be able to deny coverage because of pre-existing uh, conditions. Finally, it will, be, it will emphasize preventative care, which will save our system money by catching chronic diseases or cancer early enough to treat effectively and efficiently not through emergency room visits. The National Health Exchange will promote competition while allowing Americans to see insurance plans side by side. Rather like Expedia or Travelocity, it allows you to view travel choices and pick the ones that, you, that best fits your needs. So shall the National Health Exchange be. Private plans will make up the bulk of the exchange, but I support I support, as does the President, the inclusion of a strong public option for those who choose to participate in it. Okay. Private plans. Private plans will. The exchange will also allow American people to come together and purchase insurance at a group rate, the way large employers can. Yeah. It will be open to any private insurance provider who will offer plans that meet basic consumer protection standards, including free preventative screens. Finally, in order to make sure everyone can get coverage, we will also provide subsidies to the poorest members of our communities to help them purchase insurance, public or private. They have no choice. And we will be able to provide tax incentives to encourage businesses to cover their employees. So I'm sure that some of you have questions or concerns about certain aspects of the bill. I look forward to hearing your thoughts and to discuss your ideas. A final request. I realize that this is a highly emotional topic, and I will assume with courtesy and respect to your views and opinions, and I will only ask that you extend the, the very same to this process and to your neighbors who are here today. I thank you. Uh, first question from Joyce Schillings. Joyce asks, <clears throat> is it true that seniors on Medicare will be affected with the reform? She may want to make a comment herself. I'm um, giving them up to a minute. Or two. Is uh, Joyce here? And 
Um, actually, I cheated. I had two. But uh, since you started reading my first one, I'll go ahead and ask that one. Um, is it true that seniors on Medicare um, that have a Medicare Advantage would have to give up Medicare Advantage if they have passed the health reform? No, they wouldn't have to uh, give up the uh, Medicare health, health uh, advantage. What will happen, uh, though, is that we will be looking through Medicare programs and trying to make them uh, more efficient and more fiscally responsible. And it's the savings that we're going to find in there that should be able to pay at least two thirds of the of the um, the bill that we're trying to cover. Have a follow up. <laughs> Actually, it's not a follow-up, it's sure. another question. Um, with employees that are covered under employer health insurance and say that they do lose their job, would they net not have the advantage of going on COBRA for 18 months? Would they have to then go on a public option? Currently, um, if you don't have or you lose your insurance, that's where they lead you to. When my wife died, uh, I lost her um, the benefits from her uh, teaching uh, benefits, and they 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 counseled me that uh, you can get Cobra. I looked at Cobra, and it was really expensive, and I I just couldn't see um, spending that kind of money for the kind of benefits I was going to get. So I didn't I didn't go to Cobra. But uh, what would exist though under the under the bill is that if you lose your job. It doesn't mean that you lose coverage. And that's the aspect that we're trying to really emphasize for people. You don't lose your coverage. And you should be able to continue uh, being covered. And uh, we, we don't want anybody to be stuck with a job because they're fearful of losing their benefits. We don't want people to um, lose benefits because they got ill while they're working. That would be against the law. And we don't want people to be denied um, coverage because of pre-existing conditions. Carol Stiles, and then if Phil uh, Fidandis could identify yourself, we'll get the camera to you. Phil would raise his hand. Carol Stiles. Um, she's, she's ready to ask. Yes, my question, main question was, uh, you know, I have Medicare, but I have grandchildren, grandsons that are adults and don't have coverage and they have pre-existing conditions. When would be the earliest that this bill pass? I mean, assuming it will, that we will be able to, they will be able to get coverage. For your adult, um, is it children or, or um, nephews and nieces? Well, grandchildren, I'm sorry. For your adult um, um, grandchildren who have pre existing um, conditions, um, there will be, uh, through the exchange, the ability to choose a, a, a plan that will be affordable to them and that will meet their needs. Oh. When? When okay. might it be available? <laughs> okay. Predictions about that. Okay, under, under the exchange, uh, it's going to take about three years to get going. So uh, as soon as the bill is passed, um, your, your uh, grandchildren, if they're employed, they will be able to get a, a plan because once that bill is signed and when that ink is dried, Denying, denying um, insurance coverage by an employer will be against the law for pre-existing uh, conditions. So in, in your uh, grandchildren's uh, situation, it will be immediate. This is from Phil Fidandis, uh, and if Jason Loveman could identify himself so we can get the microphone to you. Thank you for coming out today. As a proud union member of UFCW Local 5 with over 25,000 members here in Northern California, what are you going to do to get Senator Feinstein to get on board supporting Obama's health care plan and the Employee Free Choice Act? Thank you. Uh, it 
ever since I've known um, Diane Feinstein, the senator, uh, she's always been pretty thoughtful. And for those of us who like to see immediate reactions and immediate decisions, uh, she doesn't accommodate those folks right away. But, <laughs> and um, I, I think that she tends to be more thoughtful, more studious, and thus not to mean that um, those of us who make judgments uh, in, a, in a more rapid way, uh, that we're not thoughtful either. But I think that some folks in their own style like to keep the options open as long as possible. I think today she was quoted as saying that, you know, public options may not be the only thing out there. And I think that the president said that. But the president in his speech also described the kinds of characteristics he wanted to see in a plan that would be uh, provided for those who don't have insurance, the public plan. And then he put the title under, you know, a public uh, option. And the kinds of descriptors he laid to that, I would consider very robust. And then he said, I just want to make sure that folks understand that the issue of public options is not the only thing we're debating in this entire uh, reform movement for health care. And I think that he was saying that because there was so much attention being paid to that during the August break that people forgot and some of the people who have insurance already were doubtful that they were going to get lose their insurance and have so, um, or be forced to be out of their insurance and forced to be taken a public option thing. And so I think he, once he said, you know, he said that and he also made it clear that to those who already have their insurance, you can keep that. But I want to make sure that you understand those who have it right now, he's going to add a couple of more parameters. You won't lose your insurance if you get sick, and pre-existing conditions will not uh, be an issue anymore. It'll be against the law. And so um, with Diane, um, Senator Feinstein, um, I think that it's just her style, and I think that the office um, will always invite more emails um, uh, suggesting. <laughs> no, it's true. It's suggesting that um, you know there are, there are reasons for supporting a public option um, uh, plan. Here's the next question. Jason Loveman, and if Peg Pryor would identify herself. Oh. Hi, uh, Speaker Pelosi has recently begun to waver in her support of the public option. Uh, do you think that's connected to some uh, lobbyist contribution she's recently accepted from United Healthcare? <laughs> Did you say that Speaker Pelosi is uh, is, is wavering? I, I I don't think so. I do not think so. I mean, they've. Um, They've um, caught her on film, you know, walking with the president, and the subtitles, you know, she's talking to him about public, public uh, options. Uh, in caucus, she's been very strong on, on the issue. And um, before this even became more public during the break, um, she was talking to the different groups of Democrats that we have in our caucus about the, the advisability of supporting public options. But you also asked a question here that, um, that talks about accepting um, uh, United Health lobbyists uh, to stop supporting the public options. I don't know whether she's accepting it, but um, if she is, it's not doing any good because she hasn't changed her position. Okay. And Peg, and thank, you, thank you for the question, by the way. Peg Pryor and then Roger Rivera, if you'd identify yourself. Yes, Congressman Honda. My husband and I have two uh, adopted children with pre-existing health conditions. Fortunately, we belonged to Kaiser for years. And while they were our children, they were covered. Uh, they're not so fortunate now. And I would like to encourage you to continue to support health care reform and for us to have a considered reasonable discussion about it, uh, which we so badly need. Thank you. Sure, thank you. To that, to that comment, um, 
on our website, we will, we will be posting on our website a discussion around a couple. One is a nurse, and the couple had children. Um, one, the first child was born with um, um, type 1 uh, diabetes, a pre-existing condition. But the child was covered as long as the child was with them. When, he when that child became an adult and had a job, he worked for a company that was a large company that negotiated a plan already, so he was able to enjoy that plan without the concern about the pre-existing conditions. He got laid off. Then he had no insurance. He was trying to apply for the very same insurance that he was dropped from, that he enjoyed from his parents and from his job. No luck. And that's why we think it's terribly important to be able to give people the confidence and the stability and security that your health coverage should not depend upon whether you have a job, whether you need to change a job, or whether your health has changed so that you, then that's when you really need your coverage. So that's the kind of thing that we're trying to um, do. Roger Rivera and then Shelley Leiser, if you'd identify yourself. Yes, good morning, Mr. Hunter. Good morning, Mr. Hunter. I'm also with the UFCW Local 5, and I was wondering some of the arguments from the right are putting caps on um, the um, doctors when they make mistakes and how much they can be sued for. But, and I have problems with that, but as far as insurance being able to cross and compete across state lines, I'm not sure what the prohibition or disadvantage of that would be. Um, people who don't have insurance or who want to put together a plan, uh, once the exchange is set up, um, the private insurers will be in the exchange and people can go there or a small business can go there and put together their plans. One of which choices would be a public option. Uh, the, the question of whether you can buy uh, insurance uh, in Nevada and you live in California, um, back when they did the, um, the laws that regulated this, they said that um, every state should have their own uh, insurance uh, situation where, and we should not allow people to buy insurance across state lines. And so um, that, that created a situation where you had 50 um, programs and 50 um, dominions that the insurance companies were enjoying. Some, some, some states, they have almost complete monopolies. Others, there are competition. But um, we cannot, um, the, the laws do not allow people to buy across state lines. And it's called the McCarran, uh, the Ferguson Act that gave states the right, the sole right to regulate their insurance uh, uh, companies within their own states. I wouldn't mind it. And so people talk about, you know, people talk about managing the medical liabilities, and uh, when one talks about trying to do that on a federal level, um, that was given up because that right is also within the states. So California, we have something called a. Um, a, a con some controls where you put a cap on the medical liabilities, but it's it's so contentious and um, it's not consistent across the country. So I think um, there may be that possibility and the challenge out there to look at revisiting um, the McCarran-Ferguson Act, which I would be in favor of. Yeah. Shelley uh, Lyser and then Catherine Cox, if you'd identify yourself. Okay. Hello, and thank you, Congressman Honda, and everybody else who's here. I think it is very important to keep the public option. I don't. I think that without the public option, health care costs may go up tremendously and bankrupt the nation. I appreciate your support, Congressman Honda, for the public option in the past. 
do you still think a public option is essential or are you willing to concede on the public option? Thank you. The, um, the question is whether I will give it up or not. And uh, I have to tell you that I can't. It's, it's, no, let me, let me tell you why. Let me tell you why. Uh, let, me, let, let me explain why. During um, some of our discussions in the community and in public, people used to say, Mike, why don't you just leave the whole thing alone and let the private market take care of it? You know, this is a capitalist society. Let the private market take care of it. Well, we, we passed uh, Medicare back in the 40s. Uh, they've been trying to deal with uh, uh, health care reform since 43 in every session. And it seems to me that since 43 to now, the open market had all the opportunities that they could have had for all these decades. And the only thing we've seen The only, the only thing we've seen is continuous rising premiums and debates about tort reform and, you know, lawyers are bad and, you know, there's all kinds of debates around uh, the negotiations for health care and everything else, like the people are suing each other. And the only dog that's not in the fight is insurance companies. And one of the reasons is that every state gets to control it. And so there is no leash that allows us to have some control. And so, you know, and the way we describe public option is, says a couple of things. One, says we're not gonna be too much like some of the European states where they have what we call universal health care single payer, which I, I supported, but in a, in a society like ours where we're used to having private insurers providing their plans, and there are many people who have negotiated negotiated uh, plans already with their uh, with their job that eliminating the private industry would be contrary to I think what we believe in in terms of competition. So one of the ways you do that is to provide another plan, another option for people to choose, so that within that competitive atmosphere. You know, the insurance companies are going to be looking at the millions of extra folks out there and competing for them. And so in order for them to get their attention and compete for those uh, millions of new um, clients, um, they're going to have to look at their pricing and everything else like that. Have you noticed that on TV now, they're advertising insurance programs and they said, don't worry about pre-existing uh, conditions. Mm -mm -mm -mm. <laughs> and so, you know, and it's not making fun of the, you know, that situation, but it's serious that this one component is creating so much angst among that uh, that uh, that uh, industry that we must be on the right track. <laughs> Catherine Cox and uh, Claudia Shope, please identify yourself. Congressman Honda, I'm really glad to hear that you support the public option, but I've got a question that you may or may not be able to answer. Um, I, we have a f close family friend who's got very, very bad medical problems stemming from at the root stemming from an absence of effective dental care. And although I've been lucky to be able to provide my family with Kaiser for nearly 30 years now, um, even Kaiser, as good as it is, doesn't provide dental coverage. And I know many, many people who suffer severe medical fallout from the lack of dental care. So have you heard whether there's any attempt to include or to, pers you know, how is that going to be addressed by this? I mean, it's, it's only one aspect of health care, but it's often overlooked. Thank you. Thank you. Um, what I do remember, um, 
going through the, uh, the bill is a very explicit inclusion of mental health services and um, compensation for doctors in, in, in counseling during, um, during um, moments in time when people are at the end of their life and terminally ill. Um, the vision and dental, uh, I'm not sure that I remember seeing anything in it. Um, and I belong to a exchange also. Um, they call that the best um, health plan that exists, uh, the con congressional plan. And um, quite frankly, I'm not sure what's so great about it, except that you get to choose. A, there's a lot of plans that you can choose, and some of them not bad, but um, the ones I got is just doesn't include dental and vision. So I think that I think that if it's not in there in the bill, I'll look for it. But if it's not in there, it seems to me that it would behoove those who are planning to develop these insurance plans to include uh, that in their plans. Um, when I was a teacher, you know, we had our health benefits, and then we had a separate dental plan and a vision plan. And so um, it seems to me that if that exists for groups like teachers and they bargain for it, that it seems that we should be able to create that demand for uh, medically necessity of uh, um, dental care because if dental care is not paid attention to, like among children, it can really cause uh, ultimately death. Um, and so it, it's a serious oversight if it's not in there. And perhaps if it's not in there, then through the demand of the, uh, of the, the marketplace, uh, it may be put in there. Claudia Sh uh, Shop, and then uh, Guadalupe Rodriguez, please identify yourself. Hi, I'm Claudia Show, and I'm glad to see you, Mike, and I am glad that you've supported single payer in the past. I really would like to see it uh, be supported now because I think that the insurance companies are the biggest denial of care uh, institution around. My sister's had a lot of medical problems, and the way the insurance companies deal with it is through protocols and denial of care, and that is the biggest denial of health. Uh, health care that we have currently, which is the insurance companies, and it really does a disservice. She lives in Massachusetts, and uh, it, it's a huge problem when you actually have serious health problems, and so I'd like to see us get back to Conyers and not have that be forgotten about and not have single payer be forgotten about. So what can you do to bring that stuff back? Would you help me one more time? What is it that you want to bring? Single payer. Well, single payer. Yeah. You, you yeah, want I'd single like payer? I'd like you to bring single, single, single payer back into the fold. I mean, it yeah. seems like it's being dismissed uh, because we've progressed along the way, and I really don't, sure. and I know you've pat, uh, you've uh, supported it in the past, but I'd like to have it be not forgotten. Yeah, I think that was 676, six, um, and uh, I, I did sign on it, and, um, and the reason I went to, um, the bill that we have right now, what public options would do is basically what we were seeking that single payer would do. Uh, what single payer does, it does eliminate the private insurance companies to be able to compete. And you know, I, I don't have a problem with them uh, being out there. I have a problem with them um, at will uh, increasing costs. Uh, I have a problem at will that they drop people from coverage. And I think that those are the kinds of insecurities that we need to re 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 replace and put back into uh, the system that has never been there before. And this is the promise that the bill will have for all those who have currently uh, are covered by insurance. And then so, um, and on that point, um, single pair, the, I think someone in, in the uh, Congress is going to be introducing a, a single payer bill again. So um, people have, again, another opportunity to look at that as the. But um, given the kinds of comments I've made and kind of uh, commitments I've made, um, I would wish them luck, but I don't think that in the, in the development of this country and how we started, 
I, I think it's going to be a very difficult thing to eliminate um, private insurance companies. They, you know, and even in uh, the other countries where there are what appears to be a universal single payer, there are places and there are opportunities for private insurance companies to participate. But I think that they're offering uh, enrichment of the kind of programs that you have. I think we can uh, attain that also in, in this system, but we got to give it a chance. Guadalupe Rodriguez and Judy Ricard, please identify yourself. I'm over here. Guadalupe. Okay. Um, Congressman Honda. I well, <laughs> I first want to thank you very much I for see you to my oh, right. I know I'm a little bit hidden back here. Um, I just I want to say first of all, thank you so much for your leadership and commitment to the public option plan. I think it's a very important part of whatever we get in healthcare reform and um, and as a young woman and a women's health care advocate for a nonprofit um, in the Bay Area. Um, I'm deeply concerned also specifically about women's health rights and women's health options and reproductive health care services and their inclusion in whatever plan comes out. I know that there's been a push to exclude those services explicitly in the legislation and that deeply concerns me for myself and obviously for all the women in this country. Um, I feel that reproductive health care and abortion coverage include including that is definitely necessary for the well-being of women, the well-being of their communities, and the well-being of their families, and is an integral part of whatever health care plan they receive. And I wonder what your, what your stance is on this. Let me, um, let me see if I can rephrase that question in two parts. Um, the, the issue of um, instruction and education, I don't think there's a prohibition about that. Um, but there is a very clear prohibition of using federal monies, uh, and it's currently long, uh, for purposes of, of abortion. So, um, yeah. And so, and so that's that's the current situation that we have and that we're faced with. That doesn't mean that you know there will be other avenues that are open to f folks who need constantly um, um, the other kinds of uh, instructions or choices, that for that matter. On, on a personal basis, I think that the woman's right to determine their own health and their own reproductive rights that's between that woman her family, um, her religious um, advisor, and uh, her medical um, um, advisor too. And um, in our families, um, we face that. And I know that is one of the most difficult things that a person has to deal with. And even when you make a decision based upon the woman's health and the the viability of the um, the embryo and making a decision to do so, it still wreaks havoc uh, to a person's uh, um, stability and emotion. And I know that for a fact. So, you know, we should be able to be at a point where we can talk about that and leave it to that person. And I think that um, some people say that, you know, that's not a purview where government should be entering into. And those are the kinds of things that should be your own yeah. Judy Ricard and uh, Bob Meredith, please identify yourself. Hey, Judy, you got in a lot of trouble now, you know that. <laughs> no, it's a trouble that. I, but, but this is healthcare town hall, right? We can't talk about the other trouble. Um, no. Mike, you know we love you. We're proud of you. My question seems almost silly in a way now with all these other questions that have been answered. But I was at my chiropractor last week, and he's an excellent chiropractor just a couple of blocks from here. Start talking about health care, and he said, well, you know, this whole discussion doesn't include chiropractic, and I was surprised. So I guess it's like the question about dental. If you can comment or if you can find out. I told him I'd ask my congressman. Yeah. 
um, I, I did go through HR 3200 uh, section by section and uh, dental and um, vision and chiropractic. Um, that, that was brought up to me last night at my 50th uh, um, high school reunion. Because <laughs> most of us were 68. <laughs> um, but I, I think that this is going to be the same comment I'll be making is that uh, absent that I think it's going to be one of demand and if people want to if uh, com uh, insurance uh, programs want to be able to attract folks uh, they're going to have to somehow include that in their package yeah. Yeah. Uh, we, I'd like to get the last three uh, questions in if we could, so if you could ask the questions quickly and, and Congressman Honda will respond to them quickly and we'll see if we can get the last three in. Uh, please, Bob Meredith. Yes, Congressman Honda, I believe that uh, health care is not really a right, but I believe it, it is a matter of equality. I believe that separate but equal has been abolished and dealt with by the Supreme Court a long time ago. I believe you support the public option, and I believe that if I can have access or my colleagues can have access to the same health care as you, I believe that balances the scale of equality there as for everyone else. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, that's an interesting um, way of putting it. Um, in, in my um, value system, um, I, having health care and, and, and assurance that you're going to be able to address your health care through an insurance program that will cover costs that one cannot cover themselves, and, and through this concept of insurance uh, pools, um, seems to be something that everybody should have. Um, and, and that right is 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 different depending upon people's ability to pay. What this bill really does is establishes a, a line where it says no one's going to go without. Nobody's going to go without. If you can't afford it, or a small business can't afford it, there will be uh, subsidies and there will be uh, credits for that. But no one's going to go without. Nobody should be uh, without primary care, uh, preventative care, so that the more expensive stuff that's down the road is avoided. I think that, in that aspect, it is a right. Um, in terms of equity, um, equity is, I guess it's, um, we should have equal access to the different kinds of programs and make choices, but those choices have to be real and affordable and accessible. So in that light, um, you know, I'm not sure that right and equity in this case uh, are, are distinctive, but uh, nobody in this country. Uh, and I think, in fact, we're part of the only industrialized uh, democratic country that allows um, folks to make a profit over health. And that is not right. And every other country recognizes that. So, so, so in that light of uh, equity, you know, the ability for private insurers to compete, we have to have a public option that will provide that competition and provide people that choice, that right to choose and to have that sense of equity in that thing. So, okay. Thank you. Peter, Peter Dierboff, and then uh, Dennis, go identify yourself. Uh, yes, thank you for taking my question. Uh, in his address to Congress last week, President Obama promised that he would, quote, not sign a plan that adds one dime to our deficits. However, other countries which have adopted socialized medicine, especially Great Britain, have had a great deal of difficulty estimating demand and allocating budgetary resources. Should the same thing happen in America and the President is not able to keep his promise, what provisions would your ideal bill have to dissolve an insolvent government-run insurance agency? Yeah. Thank you. 
when, when, I, when I heard him say, uh, uh, not a dime to deficits, I thought that was an interesting alliteration. Um, but it was also a commitment that he's trying to tell folks that in the areas of cost, it's not gonna, it's not gonna be a runaway cost. We're not gonna, we're not gonna add to the deficits that we already have that's already growing. Um, and what he's also saying is that the cost that we incurred, the amount of money that we are already spending in healthcare is humongous and there's sufficient um, opportunities within that pot of money that we're already expending as a country to be able to provide everything that we say we want to realize savings and through efficiencies and um, making sure that people not being readmitted to hospitals on a repetitive basis for just merely a, um, a um, what do they call that, reimbursement purposes and everything else like that, it's gonna be cleaned up. Now, we've heard over the years past that everybody's complained that you know there's all kinds of fraud and misspending and, uh, in, in, in these programs. Well, this is our chance to make it right and make every dollar work better. And that the return on investment that we put into this program pays off for everybody. And um, I think that he's on the right track. And he also said that if we don't reach our goal, then we'll look for cuts in other areas to make it happen too. And so that's a pretty tough commitment for the issue of health care for, for the people of this country. Uh, I think it's a good challenge, um, but it's not as difficult as going to the moon. <laughs> so if we go to the moon, we can figure out how to do this. This is a related question. Uh, <clears throat> Dennis uh, Go. Yes, uh, my question goes along the same line as the last question. Uh, given the fact that Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid is broke, uh, we're writing checks, writing debits to um, pay for all that, and we're talking about another trillion dollars, and I heard the President say that he was going to pay for the health care by eliminating waste and fraud. That sort of begs another question. If you already know about waste and fraud, why aren't you doing something about it now? And how are you going to pay for it in the future? I feel sorry for the next generation who has to work and pay for it for the, for the other half of the country that's not working and not paying for it. Yeah, I mean, um, that's a fair question. You know, we've been saying that all along, and how, how come we're not doing that now? Well, we're putting a bill together to do it. And we, and we said that... We said that we recognize that there is that situation existing out there, and we have to correct it. And in that correction, we'll have sufficient funds to provide the health care that uh, folks need who are going without. And so um, it's like the president said in the beginning and the end of his speech, he says lots of presidents had taken this on as an issue. Even our good friend, uh, the Clintons, tried it. And we're still at it. And he says, many presidents have done it. He's going to be the last. Yeah. So gonna do it. That's the last one. That's two o'clock. I've got this one wrap up. Thank you. Um, There are other questions that went unanswered and we reached our time, but the reason why we ask you to fill it out, your name, address, and your email is that hopefully that when you put your email in, that's opting into our ability to send you information and, and, the, and the answers to the questions that you have written. So we'd like to um, um, let you know that we're going to attempt to do that quickly um, within a couple of weeks. So. Um, I just want to uh, reassure you that those who have not had a chance to have your questions pulled, then uh, we're going to we're going to respond to it. Kirk, okay. Thank you.
I just want to thank uh, Congressman Honda for uh, coming to Santa Clara University. We do have one uh, representative of another elected official, Javier Quesada, is here from the office of San Jose City Council Member Nora Campos, and so we want to recognize his presence. Thank you for, for coming to Santa Clara. As the congressman said, representative democracy works when you express your views and you ask questions. So please do take advantage of the offer which the congressman has made to take your questions and respond quickly. You can raise more questions by email, express your views by email uh, directly to his office and you will get responses. Thank you for coming to Santa Clara University.